Welcome to the Making Waves at Sea Level podcast with your host, Tom Singer. In each episode, we will explore the interesting stories of business executives, entrepreneurs, and industry leaders who are shaking things up and growing their companies. It is time to make some waves. Now here's your host, Tom Singer. Hey, hey, and welcome to another episode of Making Waves at Sea Level. Thank you so much for coming along on the journey of this podcast. We are now almost at episode number 600. I started this show six years ago. Of course, then it was called Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. And the idea was I just wanted access to smart people who were doing cool things. And I thought I would do about 50 shows. I had no idea the impact that having a podcast was going to have on me, on my career, on the relationships I was going to build, and how much fun it was going to be to really learn to interview and get people to share their knowledge. And uh, I always tell people I'm not as good as Larry King or Oprah at interviews, but uh, I'm chasing them. I'm coming for them. And Larry King's retired. So, you know, there you go. Hey, today we're going to talk about the world of virtual presentations. I know you're all quaking in your boots because most of you don't want to speak anyway. Why would you want to do it via the computer? But it's the world we live in. So whether your company is having an internal meeting or you're an expert in your field and your trade association has asked you to come and do a breakout or some other type of talk at their now virtual event, you have to be prepared. And I'll tell you, presentation skills, they're hard. Now, I've made my living for the last 11 years speaking for companies, associations. Uh, I MC a lot of uh, like users groups for tech companies or association annual conferences, and I like it. It's what I've done. I chose to make my living uh, doing this. But for other people, you run a business, you run a department, you're, you're an expert in what you do, but standing up and talking isn't your thing. And I have seen a lot of people who since the world went virtual, this has really become they're just a fish out of water. So I wanted to bring an expert on the show today who helps people do a much better job when it comes to presenting, especially in this virtual world. So Luke Getting is somebody who I met recently. He is the founder of Puffington's, Present, Puffington's Presentations, and he helps executives just like you and the people you work with. He helps them prepare to make presentations, and he was ready when the world went virtual, because he was already helping people prepare for virtual and, and in person, but he was already doing it. And now it's all he's doing because everyone needs this help. So Luke, welcome to Making Waves at Sea Level. Thank you, Tom. Excited to be here. I, don't, I didn't know I had to pay extra to be the 600th guest, but next time I'll throw that in. Yeah, you are not. You are like, I don't know, 595, 596. 595. Yeah. Still, still, you're, you're still a couple, there's a couple more to go. I don't know the exact number. We're not there yet, but uh, we'll try to circle back. That's right. For the, <laughs> for the right fee, anybody could be guest number 600. That's there right. You go. That's right. So, Luke, how did you get into helping people with presentations? That's kind of a, a weird career. It is. I, out of college, I became an outside sales representative traveling all over the Midwest and sort of amusingly and shockingly to me, I found that my PowerPoint was one of the top, if not the top tools in my arsenal on a daily uh, basis. I was meeting with our dealer network throughout the Midwest and I was giving a presentation two or three times a day and relying pretty heavily on my PowerPoint. And so I got really interested in the dynamics of meetings and how we could, I started experimenting with how can we avoid this kind of check the box affair where I would show up, fire through the presentation that my boss had made for me, that everyone would come in from the field and listen to me present for 45 minutes and then kind of go on their way. And it just really didn't feel like there was a lot of information exchange taking place. And so I started experimenting and tinkering and and really trying to create a more interactive dynamic experience so that we were actually helping one another the way those meetings were intended. So let's so go, let's go, that. let's go a little deeper on that. Cause I don't yeah. know that I understood what you just said. So what did you do? What does that mean? The top thing I did was started introducing what I now call pivot points, which is rather than just having a linear presentation, I tried to create moments every five or 10 slides, if you will, that were pauses and were intentionally trying to ask the audience, okay, what do you next want to cover? And so basically uh, visually creating a menu and strategically creating a branching path 
so that the audience could inform me what they cared about. If I spent, again, a lot of these companies I would be meeting with once every three months, six months, maybe once only a year. And so if I wasted that meeting talking about something that wasn't aligned with their interests or their market, it was just a huge uh, waste. So as much as possible, I tried to create a lot of moments to interact and align with them so that we can maximize our time together. So let's talk about these moments. So when I think about how you use the PowerPoint, are these visual moments? Are they having slides that are just different from what every other sales rep comes in with, like like clickety, clickety, click, three bullet points, et cetera? Or are they somehow beyond visual? Are they actual like sort of like you were saying, you know, a way to pivot the conversation? Tell me, tell me more. Yeah, it starts, uh, it's better to start with the strategy uh, before the visuals, of course, but the visuals can very much help um, create that impression. So just to help everyone picture this in an in a audio format, um, think of it like a menu, you know, three, three squares next to each other. And so rather than me just saying, all right, this is section one, two, and three that we're going to cover today, I might just show a slide that says, hey, this is section cat, dog, and rabbit. And if you don't care about cat and dog and you're, you really care about section rabbit, and I, I use those so that they're order agnostic. And um, let's spend the whole day, let's spend the whole meeting talking about the rabbit section. And, and so then, and then, really do you, then do you use sort of those little PowerPoint tricks where you can skip to slide 14 exactly. and skip yep. so over we'll create, the others? We'll create intra slide links so that we can jump to section three or what was implied to be section three in bypass sections one and two. Because again, nice. there's there's kind of this mentality when you create a slideshow that your goal is to share all of those slides because that's how you strategized it. And it's, it's just foolish because the audience, you should really want to align with what your audience cares about. And if they care the most about 10 slides of the 30 you prepared, spend all your time talking about that. All right, so you were doing this, you were you were playing with the PowerPoint, your sales were going up, then what happened? I decided I wanted to take a more active role in helping with the sales consulting. And so I quit my job and um, started freelancing on that full time. Uh, I had just focused on the electronic security industry that I'd come from. And I pitched for six months. It ended up being a huge failure. I was featured in all kinds of magazines and webinars, and I made almost no money from that industry. But the presentation that I had been using for all those events at the very uh, end of the year, I submitted it to the Prezi Awards and ended up winning the Best Business Prezi of the Year Award. I didn't and even so, know. I didn't even know that was a thing. That was the very first year they did it. I barely knew about it either, but it was really exciting because all of a sudden I had people from around the country and around the world asking me to help them take their stale PowerPoint presentations and then turn them into a dynamic, um, what we call conversational Prezi presentation. And so it was a total accident. I was really focused on the industry that I'd come from. And all of a sudden, a few years later, I was running a presentation agency. All right. So let's talk pre-COVID. Let's talk about the presentation agency. What, what, what did you do? So we primarily work with companies and in, in, um, largely B2B tech companies on three main types of deliverables, executive keynotes, national and global sales presentations, and corporate templates. And it's still, it sounds funny to me in 2020 to be talking about corporate PowerPoint templates, but at the end of the day, it is still the foundation for what almost all companies use for their presentations throughout the year, throughout oftentimes years. And so um, that's, a, that's a funny deliverable to me, but our team can do some really amazing things with those. So I know that, you know, some, when you say you work with B2B tech companies, some of them are all over this stuff. And some of them I'll meet with and I'm just blown away, like how basic they are, that they barely know how to advance a PowerPoint slide. So how do you find clients? What is it? Does it come in from like the top? Does it come in from marketing? Does it come from sales? Who says uh, we need to redesign what we're using and everybody needs to learn how to do it? Marketing tends to be our main point of contact. They tend to be the ones who handle the executive uh, keynotes as well as the sales presentations and help facilitate that. We, of course, want to have buy-in and, and ownership from those other stakeholders, but it's typically marketing leading the charge on a lot of those deliverables. Nice. All right. So you were helping people. You're helping CEOs who have to give keynotes. And we all know that, that people in the C-suite, they have to do all types of presentations. They talk to their teams. They, they have to present to the board. Uh, they have to talk to investors. And very often 
there's industry conferences where they're featured as a keynote or something like that. And, and again, these aren't people who are keynote speakers. Uh, so do you deal with just the slides or do you help them with their presentation skills as well? We look at a presentation in uh, as three factors. You have your message, you have your design, and you have the delivery. Um, even though what a, a significant portion of what we've done is design, or I would argue it's probably the least important factor of those three. Uh, we've all seen great speakers who are just so dynamic and have an amazing delivery. Even if they're saying nonsense, it's still semi-engaging simply because they have an amazing delivery. And of course, you have to have a really powerful message. So we, um, we definitely acknowledge and help our clients with all three of those elements. And of course, it's very, um, we, we never recommend starting with design. You want to make sure you have your message first to make sure that's really uh, compelling and powerful. All right. So the world changed. I call like March 9th, the day the business died, because mm-hmm. I watched over 20 plus keynotes and MC opportunities that I had already booked for the rest of the year, I watched them start to evaporate into the air about March 9th. Um, And uh, there's been some online stuff, but now all of a sudden, as we get into the fall, the virtual presentations are becoming uh, more common and people can't avoid them. For a long time, people were canceling their events. Companies were saying, we're just not going to communicate. Uh, CEOs weren't even addressing necessarily all of their people, but you can't go on like that forever. So how did COVID impact the work you do? Well, I can absolutely commiserate with you on, uh, on the end of Q1 and, and Q2 especially. Um, we did have a few clients very quickly pivot to virtual events, and I absolutely applaud them for doing so because it was very easy to cancel or to postpone. And and so we did have a few clients embrace it right off the bat, which was uh, impressive. But like you said, uh, I I believe it's very important to maintain communication with your clients and with your partners uh, now more than ever. And so I I applaud all the companies who are embracing these virtual environments now. We absolutely had that, that pause of not a lot of things happening in Q2, but we're seeing a lot more companies embrace the virtual context. And yeah, there's, there's just so much. What's really interesting to me is there's so much that's the same that you want to apply the exact same way as you would in person. And there's so much that is an entirely new experience. And I know you've, um, you've felt that yourself a bit. So yeah, happy to dive deeper into that. Yeah, well, you're right. There is there's a lot that is the same. It's still communication skills, but but so much of it is different. One of the things for like larger conferences that are more than just like an hour long webinar, one of the big things that that I've really believed and and seen and it's a little self-serving because this is what I do for a living, but these conferences have to have a master of ceremonies. You can't just have a talking head over PowerPoint after talking head over PowerPoint. And then the other thing I think is really important is that we shorten the amount of time. It used to be we would go into a breakout session and we'd expect 60 or 90 minutes. Uh, most of the people who'd breakouts weren't necessarily the best speakers, but they had super content that we needed. And we would sit there in the hotel you know, ballroom and watch these breakout sessions for an hour and a half. And we were sort of captive. Uh, you know, yeah, you could be, you know, looking down at your phone, but for the most part, we were there. Now we've moved into this virtual world, and and I think we have to we have to treat these virtual conferences more like you're producing producing a talk show to some extent, and that's why my friend and I started a thing we call it the the conference talk show, and then we have a branch of it we call the webinar talk show that is all about how do we use interviews and fun to engage that at home audience. So let's take a little bit of that now to the executive who has to give a speech. What are you telling them to do? Well, I absolutely agree with you on this new context of uh, you formerly had a relatively captive audience. I think that's a, an operative word that's worth acknowledging. Um, and now because yeah, now if I'm at home people. sitting in my office and you're boring me and I can turn off my camera or it's not even a Zoom type thing where my camera is even on. I literally can go to my refrigerator. I can make a pot of coffee three rooms away in my house. And you have no idea as the speaker or my boss who told me to make sure I watch the CEO. You have no idea that I'm there. As long as my name is showing up in the list of attendees, you have no idea if I'm engaged. And the thing that people that I think it's not acknowledged enough is we're competing not only with people's personal lives as they're mostly experiencing these elements from home, we're actually also directly competing with their professional lives because most people are consuming your content 
on the same computer, if they just minimize that Zoom window, there's their email, there's their web browser, there's their Slack. And so we, it, the competition for attention is fierce. Oh, and, and, and their kid is doing third grade from the next they've room. They've got Nerf guns getting shot at them. Yeah, right, yeah. So the top thing, it's a simple one, but the thing I've seen drop off quite a bit is enthusiasm. Uh, there's this mentality that, okay, now I'm, I'm sitting at my laptop. A lot of these are being pre-recorded, so it's hard to really have that adrenaline rush you would associate with an in-person event. And I've seen Fortune 500 CEOs hunched over a laptop. You can't see that. I've, got, I've watched entire keynotes where I didn't see the speaker's hands the entire time. It was just they're them hunched over a laptop. We, we call it a, a talking head over PowerPoint, right? It's like, yeah. you're lucky you even see their face because, you know, in a lot of these, they do their, their share screen and, and their face disappears to be like a half inch. Yeah, exactly. And, and I just equally, I've seen people barely smile and that would be, that would be almost unheard of in a in-person ballroom style setting from a, for a CEO addressing an audience, but I've seen it in these virtual events. And so just trying to really be conscious of there is an audience watching this, even though I can't see them. And even though it feels like I'm just sitting on a Saturday pre-recording this, uh, this session, you need to really manage your enthusiasm and make sure you maintain it at a level, perhaps even higher uh, level than you were in person. Because again, we are competing for that attention and people feed off that enthusiasm. And it's very, very obvious when someone isn't bringing in and isn't focusing on that. All right, so let's get to the meat here. Let's say that there's a company out there, Company X, and they have a users conference and all of their executives are going to present to their customers and they hire you to help them. What are you telling them to do? What I really like to look at with them is how can we best recreate or emulate the experience to really make it as engaging as possible, just like that in-person deal. And so in some cases, I know that was a fluffy sense, but let me dive a little deeper. Um, oh, oh, I would have come back and made you. Do that. <laughs> so in some cases, not always, but I've actually seen executives present really successfully by using an HDTV or a monitor in, in kind of emulate a, a conference room style setting instead of using the traditional screen share techniques. Again, it's not every time there's ways to do it with screen share, but really what that kind of uh, forces them to do is one, stand. I'm a huge proponent of standing during your presentations. Gesture, again, we talked about not seeing someone's hands. Uh, the more you can get them to stand, gesture, and really articulate their message, it brings the energy up naturally. And so there's these little things you can do in terms of setup that help facilitate all these other techniques that I'm emphasizing. So you talk about the idea of having, I think what you said was like having a, an HD TV screen live behind them with their PowerPoint there rather than doing a share screen type situation. Uh, what about all these technologies that can put your slides in like a little box next to your head? Is it better to use like an actual screen behind you or is it better to use the whiz bang technology? I think the critical thing is to be strategic about your approach. Um, you mentioned earlier, and a lot of people have lamented it, but when you jump to a screen share in a Microsoft Teams, in a Zoom, it puts your video feed as a little stamp uh, on a thumbnail on a tiny corner. And so even if you're doing everything right, gesturing, standing, bringing high energy, the audience is barely seeing you and they're staring at what often is a static slide. Yeah. So whether you're using an HDTV perhaps behind you or using a screen share, I, be really strategic about the platform and the setup that you're using. Um, for example, I use some virtual webcam softwares. Uh, one's called Ecamm Live, one's called Logitech Capture, OBS is a popular one. And with those tools, you have much more control over the um, setup of, of the visuals where you might have a half half and half screen of your video feed in your slides. But if, if you don't have an entire team running it, OBS is like the least user friendly software. I have, I hope they listen to this and they fix it. I, Correct. I think OBS, I think the people who know how to use it and use it well, it's awesome because it's like you have a whole production studio, but as a guy running it, or just like the CEO who has to do this from home and pre-record it, if you don't know the software, and you haven't put in 20 hours to learn it, it's a nightmare. So I, I tend to stay away from a lot of the fancier software, the kind of higher end stuff, just because 
it, we're inviting more things that can go wrong, don't you think? Correct. Um, and that's what's so, you know, silver lining about this pandemic with the, with the increased emphasis on virtual events. There's a lot of very simple entry level software emerging. There's one that's in beta right now called, <laughs> wait for it, mm hmm, M M H M M. And it's from the former CEO of uh, Evernote. And it's got some amazing features. Ecamm Live, I mentioned, these are all relatively easy tools to use. You just have a few different screens that you can click on and it'll change your view. And um, I'm pretty sure so, Zoom will be releasing a lot of these things exactly, within their own yeah. platform. That's what I'm waiting for. So, you know, kind of circling back to the event context, like whether, you know, whatever your setup is, just being strategic about the way they're seeing you. They want to see you. And if you have that little thumbnail, it's just not going to be a very engaging speaking. I, again, we make, my company makes high impact, beautifully designed slides. And we'll be the first to acknowledge that those are not enough 100% to, to lean on for a virtual event. You need that dynamic, engaging speaker. All right, Luke, I've got more questions for you. But first, I have to thank the sponsor of this episode. So this episode is brought to you by Podfly Productions. Podfly, they take the time and the headache out of creating your own podcast. Podfly sets you up with the right equipment, training, and guidance to ensure that you're going to sound amazing. They do all the heavy lifting and that pesky technical work so that you can focus on creating great content, growing your audience, and interviewing really cool people who are making waves like Luke Getting. Hey, if you want to start a podcast, and I know, I know that some of you do, jump over now to podfly.net slash cool things and check out the offer that they have for the listeners of this show. All right, Luke. So you're going to help that client make really fancy slides. You're going to talk to them a little bit about standing up, how to do the stuff. What else? Interactivity. Interactivity. There's so, so much of an opportunity now that we're all on our computers, that we have a mouse a one gesture away, we can participate in polls and we can express our positive or negative reactions. Uh, we, were, we were actually advocating for interactivity quite a bit in the old world of in-person events. Wow, I mean, wait a minute. I just for a second remembered the old world of in-person <laughs> events. Isn't that crazy? God, I loved that world. I, I would do like 40 or 50 live event presentations a year. I loved that. So thanks for reminding me it used to exist. So go ahead, go on. <laughs> Well, again, there have been some exciting new opportunities. I think for, for many of y'all, especially in the Austin area, where South by Southwest is, is a major event, they've been using a tool called Slido, S-L-I-D-O, for years. And it's been a way for an audience to do Q&A via their phone or via their computer or participate in polls. And so that's something we've advocated for a long time. I believe the traditional 30-minute, 45-minute keynote where it's purely one way I believe that's going to become increasingly uh, less relevant going forward. And you mentioned, Tom, kind of having smaller uh, pieces. We're big fans of modules. And so just like I mentioned, hearkening back to my original outside sales days, um, trying to introduce a quick hitting intro, let's say it's five or 10 minutes, and then pausing. And you can use those interactivity tools that are readily available in Zoom and all those different online platforms to actually ask the audience which section you care, care about. I mentioned cat, dog, rabbit. Let's vote on it. And what, what's really interesting to me is it actually will take pressure off of the presenter. You, if you assume that you know everything about your audience and just prepare your remarks based on that, you might be making some incorrect assumptions. If you offer them the options and they tell you, you are going to have alignment. All right. So let's go back to cat, dog, rabbit. And... <laughs> Obviously, we can't do this if we're doing a pre-recorded event. So are you a proponent of even in a virtual world going live? Because the reality is a lot of meeting producers are out there telling everybody pre-record everything. It's safer. And I always think in the meetings world, when we make decisions based on safety and not the experience of the attendee, I always think that, that that's a problem. I mean, obviously we have to be safe when it comes to social distancing, but I mean, safety from the standpoint that what if their internet drops? And mm -hmm. so they want everything pre-recorded. I'm, I'm working with one client. They're making all of the speakers pre-record their sessions 
and then they're making them present them live so that if you have a thunderstorm that runs through Topeka the day you're supposed to present, we still have you recorded. Uh, if your internet drops, we still can match it up and keep going. But they want that live feel. And I get the feeling on what you teach that you lean a little bit towards that live side. I actually really like that approach you just outlined, having the backup. But I do believe there is a an element of just higher quality and, and a more organic, more connectivity approach when you are presenting live. So what's been really neat, though, I, and again, we all acknowledge that we've all experienced our share of technical difficulties over the last three months, six months, years of, of online meetings. What's really cool is you can actually convert that pre-recorded session to still create a dynamic experience. It's really simple. You just create a playlist. So you pre-record your, your talk, but you can just chop up section cat, dog, and rabbit, and you can still introduce a poll, play the intro part introduce the poll and then whatever people vote on play the section that they vote on so it's actually quite easy to implement and still create a dynamic experience even if you are electing to pre-record so in the virtual world i've, I've dealt with a couple of clients who've turned off their chat room because they want everyone to pay attention to the screen and i'm like no that's interactivity that gets people to you know to applaud as as the mc i try to give them little codes like applause is an exclamation point or something like that so that while the person's going if they say something smart the chat room lights up with people doing a bunch of uh, exclamation points or or whatever so it's simple it's interactive uh, how do you feel about the chat room as an interactive tool Huge fan in agreement with you. Um, I think the the point that's really critical there is if you have a co-host that can make a world of difference. So it's almost impossible for us to be presenting and then also following the chat and following the questions. It's as if you were presenting on stage and looking at text messages coming into your phone. It's, it's impractical. If you have an effective co-host kind of filtering through that, introducing ideas to you that are being mentioned in the chat, it's such a cool experience. And again, these are some of the silver linings with this um, fully remote world. I'm not able to interact with a presenter on stage when I'm a person one of a thousand in, uh, in a ballroom. And I kind of can in the context of a virtual presentation. So I'm a huge fan of it. Um, I do think some chat tools are better than others where you can kind of reply to threads because it can get a little unseemly. Zoom is not especially prominent. It's just kind of a, a whole running line there. So pay attention a bit to the format, but otherwise I agree. It just creates a, again, that two way experience that we're emphasizing. So my, I have a business partner. We produce a thing twice a week called the webinar talk show. And we usually don't have a live audience, although we do stream it live on Facebook, but we're doing a special interview on the 29th of uh, September where we're going to have four people from the meetings industry in there under the theme of don't cancel your events. And that's there's two of us who host the show. And so together we've worked out how we do this. So we, one of us can be interviewing while the other is gathering the Q&A from the audience and being able to chime in and stuff like that. So, so that one of us doesn't have to be following the chat the whole time. And we have a way of sort of, you know, uh, non-verbally communicating with each other who's going to do which option of what we're doing and and we find when we MC other people's events even if it's just one of us MCing it makes it so much easier for the speaker because the speaker can then pause and say hey Tom what what are, what are they saying in the chat room because one of the mistakes unless, and there's some people who are good at it but one of the mistakes most people make is while they're speaking they try to monitor the chat and then they're not right. looking at their camera they're looking down in the corner wherever the chat is and if a lot of people are using the chat it's going by really fast and it throws the speaker off so the speaker probably shouldn't be monitoring that chat in a live format if they're speaking uh so i think you're right on about having an mc or someone to to be in that with you to monitor that absolutely just helping facilitate that and one underrated piece you just mentioned there that's absolutely critical is eye contact uh, and it's, it feels awkward staring at your webcam. It really does. No, cause we're, but, we're doing this where I'm not recording the video, but you and I are recording this on zoom and you know, I, for, as a human who wants to engage and get those little cues from people, part of me wants to stare like at you while I'm talking, right. but then you see me looking down cause my camera's at the top of, of, of the thing. I mean, you're a handsome young guy. Everybody would want to stare at you, but, <laughs> but the point is, is that in order to really communicate with you, I have to look into the camera. And that's a learned skill. 
Absolutely. It takes practice. I do equate it to how there's best practices around in-person presentations in that when we're in a conference room setting, if we're, if we're a seasoned presenter, we're going to give a quick glance at the HGTV that's showing our slides, and then we're going to focus our attention back on the audience. Same thing if we have a confidence monitor on stage, we're going to give it a glance when the slide appears, and then we're going to focus back on the audience. So it's actually, it has a lot, it equates well to what we're doing in a virtual context, but again, it's just awkward. You, you got to practice it. Once you do practice it, it becomes kind of second nature. So that's what I do. I'll, I'll turn my slide, I'll give it a glance at it, and then I bring my eyes right back to the webcam. So you've been teaching executives how to do these virtual presentations. I mean, I said before COVID, but more seriously in the last six months, um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see executives make when they're presenting virtually? I mentioned the lack of energy, the lack of uh, dynamicism, if you will. Um, that was a huge thing. Um, but I also agree with you that just kind of taking an in-person 45 minute keynote and trying to apply it to uh, a virtual context just isn't the appropriate uh, way, to, way, to, way to do it. And so um, really a lot of these themes that we've been talking about throughout, just if you can figure out and strategize ways to allow the audience to be part of the experience. We've seen so many of these events where it feels like you're going through a YouTube playlist and there's just no sense of urgency that I even need to be present for this. Maybe and, no con that. and no continuity. Sometimes no continuity. It, without having, a lot of these groups don't want to spend the money to have a professional MC. And so they just get someone from their company to go, and next up is Betty right. Sue. And it's like, right. there, there's no nobody who ties the thread or weaves the content together. So I love your example that it's like a YouTube playlist. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what it's like and not in a good way. One of the elements you know, that we think about when we think about going to a conference, you are kind of in this conference mode, even when you're walking around throughout the hotel, let's say, like it's themed. There's, there's this mentality that you're in something. And so there's this, if you allow that to be broken, you're kind of distracting your audience members. And so just walking from different sessions, there's vendors, you're, you're constantly, it, it's really why people value conferences a lot of times because they can truly step away from their day-to-day -day work and they're going to be checking their emails here and there, but they're as much as possible, they're trying to really step away from that. And so if we're just allowing them to watch a quick video and then it just stops, that's, that's as if you're just throwing them right back in their home office and you've wrecked, uh, you're not, you're not taking advantage of that opportunity to build momentum, as you're mentioning with the way uh, having continuity with an MC. So I think for, for most of these executives who are still learning how to prevent, present virtually, I still think that, that people are still in kindergarten on their way to a PhD. So what, what's your final advice to people who may be giving their first or second virtual presentation? Uh, what, what should they be doing? There's so much to be learned by participating <laughs> as a participant. So it's kind of exciting in a way in that this is a new world order in some way. Like we're all kind of figuring out virtual events and a lot of our companies are on their first version ever of doing this. Mm -hmm. And so if you can just spend time, maybe, maybe tune in to one or two a week uh, leading up to your event, you'll feel what works for you as an audience member and what falls completely flat for you. And so just taking the time to, to really think it, it, it kind of gets back to the golden rule of presentations you know, give a presentation that you would want to experience as an audience member and just keeping that mentality throughout even though yes you have to deal with technical considerations that you didn't have to do before yes you don't have an audience applauding for you the way you're used to exclamation still, point exclamation point exclamation yeah point in exactly the chat room. i mean i i try to drive home to people that in many cases a lot of our clients are presenting to larger audiences than they were in a ballroom context. A lot of them, maybe those 500 to 1,000 people in that ballroom. And now they've got thousands of people and from all over the world participating. And it's so much more accessible, which should be really exciting. Even if you're pre-recording it, you should acknowledge and, and try to really appreciate that you are speaking to a huge audience yep. and try to make it as uh, compelling a, a session for them as possible. Ab absolutely. And, you know, I heard someone say the other day that they're sick of the, the term the new normal because what we're really headed for is the better normal. 
And it doesn't mean we're going to only be virtual. We're probably going to see events go hybrid, which brings with it a whole bunch of other presentation things, because then you've got a live audience and an at home audience and they have different wants and needs. And so the way the agenda is going to have to be set up, the way interviews are going to have to be done, the way they're going to have to tailor so that the, the people in the room can go enjoy food and beverage and the people at home don't feel ignored. That's going to be a whole different ball of wax. But I think it's going to be better once once we've been through it for a while. I mean, we probably have to do this for a couple of years before it's better, don't you think? Yeah, I, I encourage people to think of it as a slider scale, right? When a lot of us were doing a much higher percentage of our meetings in person uh, prior, and now we're almost 100% virtual, but it's going to shake out somewhere in between. It's going to be much further pushed to the virtual than ever before. And so what we're investing in these resources, these strategies, these talents, these are long-term talents. I've seen statistics that say, you know, up to 30, maybe 40% of the workforce they anticipate um, going forward post pandemic will have opportunities to work remotely. And that's compared to under you know, to, to single digits mm -hmm. pre pandemic. So it is going to be a significant shift. And we all of course want life to get back to normal as soon as possible. But these skills that you're investing in, these are going to be affecting you the rest of your career. And like you mentioned, I think it brings a lot of excitement around accessibility and, and appealing to an audience that couldn't always join you at the at the conference center. Absolutely. Well, Luke, thanks for joining us here on Making Waves at Sea Level. If somebody's like, oh my God, we need we need what he does, how do they find you? Just go to puffingston.com, P-U-F-F-I-N-G-S-T-O-N.com. And uh, find me on LinkedIn, Luke Getting, last name G-O-E-T-T-I-N-G. Um, I'm all at, weekly. I'm putting out little clips of, of tips that I find out here and there. So awesome. I, I love uh, this theme of, of improving our virtual meetings and would love to connect with you. Absolutely. And, and don't cancel your events, pivot and find new ways to deliver that, that uh, information because your constituencies, whether you're an association or a company, the people who would normally come to your live meeting, they need you. They need you for education and they need you for that connection to community. So don't cancel your event. All right. Thank you for tuning in. I thought this was an important message because I don't think anybody who works in a company doesn't have executives who need to be presenting and probably need to be presenting better. So I hope you walked away with a couple of good tips. We're going to be back in a couple of days with an interview with somebody just as cool as Luke Getting. And I know you're thinking, Tom, how is that possible? <laughs> but we always find somebody uh, to come in the next show who is also just as cool and who is making waves. So we're going to be back. Uh, in the meantime, if you like the show, please uh, go and rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast love. Uh, and then also tell a friend. Like right now, go tell a friend. No, I'll wait. All right. Thank you for telling somebody because everybody I meet who says they listen to the show, I ask them, how'd you find it? And they tell me somebody told me about the show. So I checked it out. So uh, be sure to spread the word for me because I just don't know enough people to do it myself. All right. Go on out there. Make some waves. Make sure that you're climbing that career ladder, but that ladder is against the correct wall because you don't want to get to the top and figure out you did all that work only to get somewhere you don't want to be. And uh, go uh, try some new things. Have some fun. And while you're at it, have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Making Waves at Sea Level podcast. Without your listening to these in-depth conversations, there would be no show. Connect with Tom at TomSinger.com and follow him on Twitter and Instagram at TomSinger.